afternoon, everyone. Welcome. And I see people walking in. Thanks for uh, dodging all the uh, construction. Uh, thanks for the good weather, thank goodness. So good afternoon, I'm Miriam Nolan, and I'm president of the Community Foundation for Southeast Michigan. We're really pleased to co-sponsor the Future of Information series with the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation. And I want to acknowledge Katie Locker, who is our great partner and thought leader. We all know Katie, and you'll see her later uh, in this show. We very much appreciate the uh, collaboration of the Knight Foundation and their financial support. We also are grateful to WDET Public Radio and WTBS Detroit Public Television for their assistance, and a thanks to the Henry Ford Museum for, our for having us here this afternoon. Today's talk by Dr. Roman Chaudhary is the third lecture in a series we're calling The Future of Information. Great communities and democracy democracies don't just happen. They take informed citizens who engage in civic life. How communities receive information is an important part of not only how our decisions are made in our own lives, but also how our communities work and serve all residents. One of the roles of the Community Foundation is to build civic infrastructure, having access to clear, relevant, and reliable information is an important part of that infrastructure. That's why we're so excited about raising awareness of how information flows and how it's rapidly changing. This series will build on the work of the Knight Foundation, but will not be a typical speaker's series where people come, listen, and depart. This is a critical time to raise awareness of this issue to get more people thinking about how broader communities learn and ultimately how we can take action. Please don't make this a one-way conversation. If you go to our website, you'll find recent reports from our past speakers, Dana Boyd of Data and Society and Amy Webb of the Future Today Institute. We've also added a new AI document from Dana Nasera in case you weren't able to get one of those hard copies when you walked in. You'll find all that information on our website. We've also created a forum where you can talk with one another and, and learn more about the future of information and how it impacts media, technology, and democracy. Our hope, the Community Foundation's hope, is that the Future of Information series will connect national leaders in data and information with local residents who are thinking about how changes are impacting their communities in our democracy. Dr. Chowdhury is going to spend time today talking about the social implications of artificial intelligence and the responsibilities we have in society as a result of technology. Please stay engaged. Again, thanks for your participation. It is my real pleasure to introduce today's moderator, Christy McDonald. Christy is one of this region's most engaged, engaged news personalities and we appreciate her willingness to again give us time and lead these important conversations. Thanks again for all of you for coming. And let me just also point out that uh, Christy is the anchor of One Detroit, One Detroit, which we're all enjoying watching now on Detroit Public Television. Christy's full bio is in your program. It's my pleasure to turn the show over to Christy. Thank you very much to Miriam and good afternoon to all of you. I'm so glad to return to the Future of Information stage. I was here during the April discussion with futurist Amy Webb and I am very excited today to extend the conversation by focusing on artificial intelligence. You know, AI is such a critical topic and we need to spend time talking about how data is impacting society in so many different ways and on so many different levels. Things are changing rapidly, and it leads to a lot of questions about AI that I'm sure you have. I know I have them. Who's making the decisions? Will algorithms change how the next generation sees the world? And what can we do about it now? 
I'm really looking forward to learning more from Dr. Ruman Chowdhury and then widening the combination with a Q&A session with two local experts. John Quant is going to be joining us. He is the Vice President of City Solutions with Ford Motor Company. And Diana Nussera, she's the Director of the Detroit Community Technology Product. And she's also one of the authors of the AI Guide that was distributed earlier. So I hope you have a copy of that along with you. So our job today is to look at AI through both a grassroots and a corporate lens. And we designed this event to include several ways for you to get in on this conversation. We're going to have audience Q&A after Dr. Chowdhury speaks. And if you are tweeting today, which I know you are, you don't have to sit on your phone. You can use the hashtag future of info so you can get in on that conversation. And for people who are watching the live stream from Detroit Public TV, hello, thank you so much for joining us in this way. You should visit the futureofinfo.org, futureofinfo.org, where an online discussion space has just opened up so you can continue the conversation while you're listening today. The space is also going to be active after the talk, so please check it out. Continue to share your ideas, your questions, and keep the conversation going. As others have noted, we are honored to be joined by Dr. Ruman Chowdhury today. She is a world-renowned data scientist, and she's an AI expert that works for Accenture. I'm very excited to hear her today, and I know you are as well. Ladies and gentlemen, join me in welcoming Dr. Chowdhury. Thank you. Thank you very much for that amazing introduction. I'm so pleased to be here today and so inspired by this location. Um, I was touring the museum earlier, and I live in Silicon Valley. I, I live in San Francisco specifically. And we're always talking about innovation, disruption, et cetera, as if we were the ones that invented it. And it is truly amazing and humbling to be here and see so many of the same parallels from over a century ago being discussed in a way that's very relevant to what we do today. So hi, I'm Rahman, and I do artificial intelligence and ethics. What does that mean? So artificial intelligence seems like this far off futuristic term, something we don't really understand, something that maybe is the subject of movies. And maybe when you think about artificial intelligence, you think of something like this. This is Sophia the robot. You may think of some sort of a humanoid form with some inner mechanical workings happening. And yes, robotics is a big field in artificial intelligence, but the kind of artificial intelligence that probably influences you, your children, your parents, your siblings, and everyone around you today actually looks something more like this. You may recognize most, if not all, of the icons on, on that image. Artificial intelligence is what is behind and what is powering the way we interact with the world today. So from your social media to the media you may watch on YouTube or other, other channels, um, to, to the kinds of things and products and goods you're offered on online websites, artificial intelligence algorithms is powering the information that you are seeing. So what you think is the world is not really the world. It's actually a bit of a bubble. So why does technology need ethics? So I will start this by saying that artificial intelligence, these algorithms, will shape the world in an immense way. That's not even a question anymore. It has already happened. It will only continue to grow. And it's a very powerful and wonderful thing that that's what's happening. But what we're realizing is we need to understand the ethical implications of what's happening. So when we think about bias, often when, when we think of technology, we think about the biases that may happen. And, and there's, there's two kinds of bias. So most of the people in the audience probably think of these kinds of biases, societal bias. Um, and there is a notion among technologists sometimes that data is some sort of an objective truth, that it is, it, it is a, it, it's something that is independently understanding and mapping the world as it is, and therefore that is some paradigm for us to reach or reflect, right? But as a social scientist, my background actually is in quantitative social science. We understand that data is not an objective truth. It reflects institutional, cultural, and social biases. So it's a really wonderful organization. The Future Privacy Forum has, has written up what are the kinds of harms that can happen due to societal bias. So if one, we can have a loss of opportunity. In other words, people are denied things due to an algorithm malfunctioning, but in a sense not malfunctioning, simply reflecting the biases that exist in society. 
Number two, you can have an economic loss. In other words, literally being denied a job or a loan, things that algorithms are already being used for today. Number three, social detriment. So the stere reinforcing stereotypes or creating filter bubbles, perceptual bubbles where we think that the information we have is factual and true and what everybody else believes, but is actually more of a function of what the algorithm is feeding us. So we have to think of these algorithms as basically optimization functions. And what are companies optimized to do? It's optimized to feed you what will make you happy. So it's the equivalent of companies want to always give you dessert. So if they know you think a particular way about, let's say, the current political situation or some topic or issue, guess what? It will feed you self-reinforcing media because why would you then want your customer to be uncomfortable by challenging their notions? What most people want actually is to be told they're right. And then finally, the loss of liberty. One very um, impactful example that was highlighted in the, pre in the last few years was the use of an algorithm called the Compass algorithm by a company called North Point. And it was sold to private prisons. And it determined whether or not a prisoner should get parole. And this algorithm was completely black box. In other words, it was the proprietary information of the company. They did not share it. They just sold the output. Um, prisons used it. And what we found later, due to the investigatory practices of ProPublica, was that it actually had discriminatory outcomes. In other words, it was harshest on black women. So one thing we will see often in algorithmic bias is that the people who are already disadvantaged by, by society are the ones who will continue to be disadvantaged against. And what makes it worse is that it, it happens in a way that seems invisible. It happens in a way where human beings feel like we have no way of having any agency over the outcome or addressing or redressing the harm. So interestingly, I had a conversation about using image recognition in stores to catch potential shoplifters. And what somebody said was, well, yes, I understand there can be bias, but wouldn't you possibly have bias if you had a, a police officer in the store and they were targeting particular people who looked a particular way? And I said, yes, but what would be the first thing you would do if you were unfairly pulled over by a store security officer? You would say, I want to talk to your manager. Right? and you would go through the appropriate channels. Now, we have no algorithmic equivalent to, I want to talk to your manager. And that's the kind of thing I try to do at my job at Accenture. I work with companies to not only create less biased artificial intelligence, but also to think about if something bad happens, what can people do about it? How will you help fix the harm that may be caused by the AI that you build? So this is the kind of bias, experimental bias, that data scientists like myself think about. It's a really interesting thing. Sometimes there's a bit of a lost in translation moment that happens between technology folks and non-technology folks. As I mentioned, I am a quantitative social scientist. I've been programming for about half of my life. When I look at a model output, there is this thing called an error term, and it's a number, it's a value. It doesn't mean an ism, like on the previous slide. It doesn't mean sexism or racism. It's actually a term that I want to have in my output. So quantitatively, experimental bi well, bias is something you may want in your output. Experimental bias is something people like myself have thought about for a very long time. I call it the Yelp effect. So Yelp, the only time you go online and talk about a restaurant on Yelp is when you've had an amazing experience or a terrible experience. Nobody ever goes on Yelp and says, I had a perfectly average time, the restaurant was adequate, I was handed a very passable sandwich, and I moved on about my day. And we don't. We write when, um, when there are things that are happening on one end of the spectrum or the other. And as a result, that actually is a form of reporting bias. I don't actually capture my full universe of data. And, and this is the important part, the data that I don't capture has a systematic nature to it. In other words, I am missing the middle of my data consistently. So if I'm missing data, but it's completely random, that's actually not necessarily a bad thing. If I am missing data and there's something systematic about it, in other words, I do not pick up people who are low income, I do not pe pick up people who are in, live in a particular region, that's actually a problem because when I build my algorithms or my models, then I am not optimizing it for my full community. But this is the kind of bias data scientists think about. So when we try to build a product and people say, get rid of bias, we say things like, can't get rid of bias. 
right? Because we're thinking of bias this way. Most technologists are not trained to think of the social implications of what we've built. And again, being somewhere as amazing and insightful and thought-provoking as the Henry Ford Museum, we think about the, the very amazing cultural and social implications of the technology that we build, how it's shaped all of our lives in ways that are just so integral to, to how we live and exist. I was, I was walking by the, the wall full of different telephones, and I was commenting to the woman who was walking me around, Emily, that I don't think most kids today know how to dial a rotary phone. They would look at it and be like, I don't, I don't know what to do. And yet the phone is such an integral part of our lives. We look at our iPhones constantly, almost to a dangerous extent. Um, but something like the telephone, which was created so long ago, has evolved over time, has had an impact on society, and continues to have an even growing impact on society with all these new technologies. So when I talk to people in tech, one thing I think about or talk about quite a bit is a concept I call moral outsourcing. So what is moral outsourcing? Here, this is, these are some headlines that you may have seen in the news, right? So AI robots are sexist and racist, or um, how to avoid racist algorithms. Frankly, I've been programming half my life. I have no idea how one would do this. Um, but you know, I, I also feel um, maybe a little protective of my algorithms. Um, I think this is an unfair description of the way al algorithms don't have free will. Algorithms don't have preferences or biases baked in. Using the term racist algorithm is wrong because if there is a racist outcome, it is only because a programmer has misspecified something intentionally or unintentionally, usually unintentionally, or this algorithm is just reflecting what it sees in the real world. I fed it data from the real world, and guess what? The real world is not a very nice place sometimes, and I have to appreciate and understand that when I build a technology that actually is almost innocently just doing what it's told. It really is like a child in the sense that it just picks up its cues from what it's seeing around it, does not make an assessment of right or wrong unless I, as a technologist, have specified what is right or wrong. By the way, I have to say that. And then its outcome is simply just reflecting what it's seeing. So here's my fear, and this is, this is a bit of a historical segue. As I mentioned, I'm a social scientist. One of my subfields is in political philosophy. So we have these racist algorithms, let's say, right? And things are happening in mass, and, and we're confused and un trying to understand, like, what do we do? And, and we, we actually faced a, a very similar thing in, in our global history. At the end of World War II, people wanted to understand why entire nations could be complicit in the genocide of a group of people. How could people just idly sit back and watch their neighbors get carted away to death camps? And Hannah Arendt is this amazing philosopher, and she went to the Eichmann trials in Jerusalem to understand like, what, what is the face of evil? What does it look like? Who are bad people? What, what are their characteristics, right? So when we say racist algorithms made by these ignorant programmers, but what, what are the characteristics of these bad people doing these bad things? And what she was impressed by, and I think impressed is the word I use for it, is their mediocrity, their averageness. And she coins this phrase that I think is very applicable to when we talk about this fear of AI. She calls it the banality of evil. Because you see, evil is not just a bad person sitting in a position of power. It is the support network that exists underneath that person. And it's not just the people who actively support. It's the people who say, look, I'm just doing my job. Which, by the way, is one of the most common phrases that a lot of the Nazi soldiers said, is they're like, look, I was, I was just doing my job. Everybody was doing, you know, getting a job in government, and that's kind of what you had to do. So I just did it. I don't, I didn't really, I didn't kill the Jews. I just drove the truck full of Jews to the concentration camp, right? Um, but it was amazing how the cognitive dissonance of people and, you know, almost the Kafka-esque bureaucracy of things made it easy for people to disassociate their own culpability from the outcomes of what they built. And I love this phrase because it really defines how sometimes technologists react when faced with the consequences of what they've built. So I'll give you an example. One thing that's happening today is this concept of predictive policing. In other words, what companies are hired to do, and this has already been implemented in many cities around the world, um, companies are hired to create an algorithm using the crime rate to optimize where police officers should go. 
now, anybody who knows anything about criminal justice knows that this crime rate, remember back to this experimental bias, this data bias, there is something syst uh, systematic about the, uh, what the profiles of the people that tend to be pulled over, that tend to be arrested, and the kinds of crimes they tend to be charged with, even for the identical infraction. So in other words, we know that we don't have a history of unbiased crime reporting or crime arresting. So when, when I say I'm measuring crime, I'm not really measuring crime, I'm measuring the number of arrests, right, of people, and the number of phoned in complaints. So if I then take that, which I know to be biased, based on socioeconomic economic status, based on race, then I build an algorithm, and I deploy this algorithm, and then cops go out there, right, and then they're arresting people. Well then, th there is an impact of this technology because you're harassing communities based on what we know to be biased information. So there was, there was this one example where, this was be, where image recognition was being used along with predictive policing to determine if somebody was a gang member or not. Right? So facial recognition is a very flawed technology. So when faced with this challenge, this is what the engineers said. They said, I, couldn't, I can't be sure how the tool would be used. I'm just an engineer. So to give you another example, NVIDIA, one of the biggest tech companies in the world, um, recently open sourced, in other words, made freely available this technology called Deepfakes. And what Deepfakes does is it can take my face and you can create a very realistic image of me saying something I have never said. So in this era of fake news and fear of, of targeting people with false information, this company has now open sourced the ability of any human being to create a lie. And essentially, there's no backdoor, there's no verification, and they're not even trying to create anything that would stop the misuse of this technology because that's the nature of open source. You make it freely available to everybody. Right? So there is this lack of understanding of the consequences of the technology we build because technologists think we are somehow objective or above it all, or as scientists, we are, we are just objectively pursuing science. Well, again, back to World War II, that also was something that scientists faced, whether or not to, to use the information captured by Nazis on their horrible experimentation on Jews, and the decision was to not use it. So even scientists have taken a stronger stance on the appropriateness of using or not using technologies for certain purposes. So what does this have to do with moral outsourcing? So as I mentioned, we've sort of anthropomorphized this AI. We want to give it a face and a body. Um, we want to give it things like free will because we use terms like racist algorithm, right? And then we know that that's actually very convenient for technologists because they can say, step back and say, I'm sorry, I'm just the engineer, I just built it. I can't control what's being done, which by the way is false. This is why I've coined the term moral outsourcing. So what it means is that we anthropomorphize AI to shift the blame of negative consequences from the human to the algorithm. So as a technologist, like that sounds great, I can build whatever I want, do whatever I want, no consequences to me, right? But what's the problem with it? So remember all those fears I was talking about in the very beginning about artificial intelligence and taking jobs and robots and you know, Skynet, I used to get asked a lot of questions about Skynet. Well, moral outsourcing feeds those fears. Why? Because when I see the term racist algorithm, there's no human. I effectively linguistically remove the human being from this, this relationship between humans and technology, and then I feel like I have no power. I feel like I can't do anything. And if a technologist, the person who built the thing is saying, I don't know what to do, what are you supposed to do? What is an average person supposed to do then? So what drives our fear is this moral outsourcing, A, this constant move to anthropomorphize artificial intelligence, something that's not something that has free will or, motiva or individual motivation, but number two, technology, technologists' unwillingness to understand and embrace the consequences of what we've built. So why does this matter? So as I mentioned, AI looks more like the apps on your phone than it looks like Sophia the robot. And as human beings, you're constantly being shaped, manipulated, or as we like to call it in tech, nudged, to do things that you don't even realize you're doing. Your data knows more about you than you know about yourself, and companies exploit that information. However, algorithmic determinism, as I define it, is, is the way that these companies are nudging you towards being a particular way. So at the end of the day, these are all companies that want to sell products, they want you to use their things, and of course they want you to be happy individuals while using it, but that happiness may actually come 
for a short-term gain to for a long-term detriment. So also, this is where I get a little bit of audience participation, and again, inspired by where we are. And in general, can you name some of your heroes to me? Mahatma Gandhi. Mahatma Gandhi, that's a good one. I just sat in Rosa Parks' bus seat and I was literally tearing up. She's one of my heroes. Anybody else, one more? Oh, sorry, what was that? Alice Paul. Alice Paul, I don't know who that is. Ah, suffragists, great. So our heroes are all people who did something more and something better and something different than their life's path carved out for them. Rosa Parks sat on that bus seat and decided, you know what, I'm not gonna get up for you. And I may just be a black woman on my way home on the bus, and I know society tells me I should get up and move for you, but I'm just too tired to move, and I, I, don't, I don't want to. So our, our heroes are not people who did what society expected of them. People who just lived their average lives are not the people we, we memorialize in museums. So why does that matter? I mentioned the filter bubble earlier. So as I, so as I was saying, our, our heroes are people who do something more and something bigger, and they see a bigger world. So when, what is a filter bubble? A filter bubble is this curated world that you and I see when we step into our social media, which is, or, or our, our consumption of media, which is increasingly online. So as I mentioned, these algorithms are built to feed you the things that make you happy right now. So the filter bubble, which we have, by the way, lived in for over 10 years. The book, The Filter Bubble, came out almost over 10 years ago. So this person did their research and wrote a book about this. We are constantly surrounded by a, a comfortable bubble where we live in thinking that, A, we are always right on our political views, our views on different social issues, but worse, B, that there is no dissenting opinion. So the worst part is not that I'm constantly being reinforced, that if somebody were to come to me and challenge my views, I would say, you're crazy, I've never seen that thing you're talking about, you have no idea what you're saying, you're just some weird fringe person, right? So not only do I live in this world of self-knowledge and self-reinforcement, I'm totally convinced that anybody else who thinks differently from me has no idea what they're talking about. So algorithmic determinism is the way in which our algorithms are shaping us to fit a particular mold. So if you, if you know anybody who works in marketing, for example, we, they do these things like create personas. Who are the people that shop at our store? Who are the people who go to our website? Maybe there's like six or 10 personas. You can think of algorithms as having hundreds of personas, but they're still personas, and guaranteed you're bucketed into one of them. So they know you as a particular type. You are um, a woman in your late 30s who lives in San Francisco and you know, has a cat and a dog, and they've, they've got you all figured out. And then they start targeting you with things and with products of your type. Now, algorithmic determinism is the way in which we are pushed to be less individual, to fit into that comfortable mold that companies want us to fit into so they can continue to know exactly who we are and target us with the information that they think we want, the products they think we want to buy. But let's say you are a, a woman in your late 30s who lives in San Francisco, works in tech, but likes to ride motorcycles. Now that may not be obvious from my typology, but I would never be exposed to anything that I would like. Or let's say I want to pick up a new hobby or learn something new that's out of my type, right? As I mentioned, our heroes are people who, want, who did more than what the world expected of them. So what I worry about with algorithms, and this is increasingly happening, is that we'll get put into a social strata, an economic strata, even like an educational intellectual strata. The algorithm will be like, you know what, that's the best you can handle. I don't think you could do more than that. So I'm just gonna give you things that people of your type should be doing and people of your type should be watching or should be reading. So in a quantitative sense as a data scientist, I define that as a measurement bias plus a feedback loop. So what's a measurement bias? I was thinking once about who Spotify must think I am based on my playlist. <laughs> and I'm laughing because I must be a really weird person. Um, so the data that companies get is actually not complete. There's no way a company knows everything about me. They know a lot of things about me, sure. They know certain specific things about me, but they don't know everything about me, and they don't know who I am as a human being. I have free will, I have judgment, I make decisions. I am not giving all of that information to a company. And for sure, my deepest secrets, my deepest wants and hopes and desires are things that companies don't have about me. So when a company types me as a particular you know, in a particular box, I'm flat. I'm nobody, I'm nobody with any sort of depth. 
Well, you add that plus a feedback loop. In other words, they target to me things that I like, I buy them, I like them, and I continue using them. Well, it's sort of a self-reinforcing hypothesis. So I'm gonna go, so, oh, sorry. So measurement bias is what you think you are measuring is not exactly the thing you are measuring. So I used the predictive policing example earlier. Crime is a really great example. A lot of people don't realize, by the way, that when we say crime, we're not actually measuring the true amount of crime. There's so much crime that goes uncaught and unreported, and there is a pattern to that, right? The people who can get away with crime are usually the people who have the most means. I used to work in a very affluent part of New York called Westchester County. That's where the Clintons live, that's where Gwyneth Paltrow lives, et cetera. And I swear you could not get pulled over for a speeding ticket there. You just couldn't. I would go 90, 95 miles an hour in my little tiny, my little tiny Corolla. Um, not the smartest thing to do. Um, but I could never get pulled over by a cop because everybody who lives there is somehow connected or the kid of someone who's very connected. So if you're a cop and you're gonna pull over some kid, you know, joyriding on the road, most likely you're gonna lose your job, right? There are plenty of communities in which you, you just need to not, not roll through a stop sign and a cop will pull you over. And guess what is often based on socioeconomic status and race, right? So measurement bias, what you think you're measuring is not actually what you're measuring. So measurement of crime is not a true measurement of crime, it is a measurement of this biased way that we enforce the rights, the, uh, this, the rights of police officers. Second is a feedback loop. So it's a structure that causes an output to eventually influence its own input, right? So I'm gonna go back to the example of predictive policing, right? So we have these cops, there's an algorithm, they're deployed to go somewhere, and guess what they'll do? They'll do their job. They'll catch criminals, and then they'll, go, they'll feed back into the algorithm because the algorithm is constantly updating with crime measurements, and they'll be like, oh great, we did our job. You know, our algorithm works, and then what's worse is it is amplified and reinforced, so they say, oh my God, cops caught more people, we need to send more cops out there. So the neighborhoods that already target and harass get targeted and harassed even more, and the people who get away with it because of their connections or who they are or who their father is will continue to get away with it, and this will be algorithmically implemented. So back to this notion that we have no way of saying, hey, take me to your manager to an algorithm. We have no way of even knowing how this is happening, and certainly, no method of redress. It's hard to say, oh, your algorithm is unfairly sending more police officers to my district than another district, right? Because they are catching crime, they're just not catching other crime because you're so heavily focused on the certain communities that you've always spent too much time focusing on. So those are primary harms. I outlined them earlier, loss of opportunity, right? Uh, loss of liberty, economic loss, things like that. And a lot of those are actually, fortunately, regulated again. So we have laws to protect people in particular situations from discrimination based on age, race, gender, ability, uh, things like that. But what's really interesting, and algorithmic determinism moves into this space, it's this concept of secondary harms. So you know, let's say I showed you a very particular playlist because I've decided you're black and urban, and that must be what you like. It's not good, but it's not denying you a job, right? And what it is doing is it's putting you into a type, it's sort of nudging you, and maybe it's, you don't like that, but it's not causing you a harm. But I actually think that that's a really, really dangerous thing. So this image is from just actually kind of a fun project that Baidu did at KFC in China. And they had a facial recognition uh, ordering screen, and you'd go and you'd like, you know, just like a fun little thing. You go up to it, it sees your face, it scans you, it gives you some feedback on what you should order. So it'd say, oh, you know, you, you, based on your face, this is what you should order, right? Complete pseudoscience, right, whatever. But here's literally from the press release. So it said, the person said, a male customer in his early 20s would be offered a set meal of crispy chicken hamburger, roasted chicken wings, and a Coke, while a female customer in her 50s would get a recommendation for porridge and soy milk. Mm-mm, porridge and soy milk. Sounds great. Right, so if you're a woman in your 50s, that's actually rather insulting. Right, so when you think about how gendered it is, our assumptions of what people should be, right, who, what they should eat, I mean, it does for men and women, translate down into who you, what, into who you are and how the food you're consuming drives this notion of who you ought to be. And, Every woman in this audience understands this argument, right? There's this, women should be dainty. Women shouldn't be messy when they eat, right? If you're, especially if you're an older woman, just get out of everyone's way, be invisible, eat your porridge and soy milk, 
right? Like don't 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 overdo it, right? But so and and that that's like the image that we're fed by society. Women should eat salads and drink a lot of smart water. If you, if, the, if the number of pictures of women wearing white doing yoga and getting images didn't convince you, all of the commercials that are constantly inundating us about how we should eat, what we should eat, how we should comport ourselves, they should. So we think about this press release. So now we're going to algorithmically enforce that. So we introduce what we call in tech, we call it friction. So what we usually want is a frictionless experience. That's why, by the way, it's so easy to go on your social media when you have like three seconds and you realize that, oh, you know, oh, I have three seconds, I'm waiting in line. What's happening on Twitter? What's happening on Facebook? Just constantly. They create a frictionless experience. They just want you to slide right in, be inundated with their media and come, you know, and just constantly be re-engaging. So what they're doing here by dictating to you who you ought to be is they're introducing friction. So number one, let's say you're a woman in your 50s, you come up to this, it's like porridge and soy milk. I don't eat porridge. I want a sausage, egg, and cheese biscuit. It's breakfast time, right? So now you have to say no to that. The next thing it gives you is a customized menu based on, again, who it thinks you are. So most likely you would say, oh, you don't want porridge and soy milk? Have yogurt. Have this. Have these, all these healthy things that women of your age ought to be eating. And now you have to go through and say no, 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 until you get to the thing you want. So again, it's not denying you a job, it's not denying you an opportunity, but what it is doing is it's subconsciously telling you that something's wrong with you. Because the average woman of your type wants porridge and soybean milk for breakfast. What are you doing with your sausage, egg, and cheese biscuit? And this really feeds into the narrative of body shaming, fat shaming, food shaming that happens to a lot of people, not just women. So it's pushing us, and then to flip it over to men, if you're a man and you want to eat a salad, well, this thing is telling you, eat like a man. No, no wimpy salads for you. Aren't you a real man? You should be having chowing down on a chicken sandwich or ribs or something manly. So introducing this friction, trying to push you into type, even something as seemingly simple as food, holds a lot of weight in society. Because food is the life and the culture of often who we are. And a lot of our societies, a lot of our cultures are built around food. And to tell people that this is wrong and that is right, to nudge you in a particular way, even a seemingly innocuous example, actually matters quite a lot. Because what happens is you get constant messages that who you are is wrong, what you want to do is wrong, and you should just do what the algorithm is telling you to do. Because otherwise, it's, they're putting all sorts of barriers in your way. So back to when I said who our heroes are, right? So, that was a seemingly innocuous example. Let's talk about one that's a little more loaded. Schools can now get facial recognition technology for free. So this one company has said, you know, we, we will identify who potential school shooters are, who troubled students are, using a facial recognition algorithm. Now that scares me, to be honest, not just because of the surveillance state nature of it, but I want to know how the heck they're going to identify what aberrant behavior is. What is it? Is it just, just because you're not the captain of the cheerleading squad or, or quarterback on the football team? You're not fitting this fixed notion of what it means to be a good high school kid? By the way, high school and that age is all about exploring who you are as an individual. It's all about pushing boundaries. Your best memories in high school probably weren't about sitting obediently in class. They're often about all doing all the things you probably weren't supposed to do, but have probably shaped you as a human being today. And now we're going to say, under this guise of, I'm going to catch these problem students, um, we're going to use facial recognition to enforce good behavior, which, by the way, means that up front, somebody, and not you, has to define what it means to be a good high school student, what it means to be obedient. Right? And that's really, really frightening to me that even at a young age, we're starting to push kids into being a particular way because definitely Big Brother is watching and it will be enforced. So the question is, can facial recognition technology really identify what, what expressions and movements means that, that someone can, will evolve into a school shooter as a problem student? And then what do we mean when we say problem children? High school is a really critical time. Other kids are mean. What will probably happen, back to this measurement bias and feedback loop, is you'll, the algorithm will probably pick up the kids who are already picked on today anyway, and this will give an, a give an in for them to be picked on even more. Because now you're the weird, creepy kid, that the, and reinforcing that bias to say, oh, see, I knew, I knew you were a weirdo. 
I, I knew you were a reject, the algorithm even said so. So it's reinforcing that bias and feeding itself back into the loop and ostracizing people who, are, who maybe are different, who act differently or dress differently or think differently, or who may be differently abled. I, I'm curious to know how this facial recognition understands people who are on the spectrum, may have Asperger's or autism, and how they might respond to certain situations, and how they are thinking of building it so that these people aren't alienated. I can almost guarantee you they've not thought of these things. So, all of this doom and gloom aside, people ask, well, what do I do? My goal is to empower regular people to take action. I think a lot of this narrative seems like, well, it's Google's job to fix itself. How, why would Google want to fix itself? Who's going to fix Google? The government? Who, you know, who is responsible for this? And there is so much responsibility held by companies and so much responsibility that's held by governments. But there are things that you as an individual can do to make sure you're not subject to this craze of moral outsourcing and also this fear of algorithmic determinism. So for the first part, one, you can combat virtual bias by combating real world bias. It sounds corny, but it's true. Data sets are biased because biased things happen in the real world. Stopping biased things from happening in the real world actually helps create better algorithms. It, it's a combination of the virtual and the real, and it's something that real people can do. Second is avoid tech solutionism. There is way too much of tech companies and individuals thinking that tech will just solve racism or tech will just solve the problems that, we, that exist today, and it won't. Human beings solve problems, tech is a tool, and tech is a great tool, and it can enable great things to be done, but it will not automatically solve problems. We have to design it to solve problems. So those are the two things. So just relying on technology to be able to fix things isn't how things work. And finally, in thinking about algorithmic determinism, the most precious thing you own is your data. So the first thing people will say now is data is the new oil. It was an Economist article. I actually think data is more like the periodic table. So oil has fixed outputs of fixed value. Data is an immeasurably valuable thing. So how we, how technologists arrange and rearrange your data within algorithms can end up in really valuable outputs or this data could be absolutely useless. So most people think that the way companies take and use data is a very linear transaction, kind of like, you know, I give you my email address to get 15% off on your website, and then you, you send me sort of spammy, annoying emails. Very, very linear, very transactional. What they don't understand is that often it's something like my GPS location plus the distance from uh, the number of gyms near me may end up actually influencing my insurance premium because they have an idea of, let's say, how many steps I walk per day, my proximity to fitness centers, and whether, whether or not I go to them. That's how your data is used. So the first thing is to say, to understand if the data you are giving is worth it. It is always a transaction, no matter how innocuous the data seems. And even if companies don't know how to use your data, I can guarantee you it is all being hoarded in case they want to use it tomorrow. So I'll give you a really great example. Um, the biggest, one of the biggest conferences in artificial intelligence is called NIPS. Facebook presented a paper one year um, analyzing the text that people write but do not post on their Facebook feed. In other words, anytime you got into a Facebook argument or wanted to post something really emotional or angry or upset and you typed it out and you're like, you know what, I'm not, and you deleted it, guess what? It was stored, it was saved, they did an analysis on it, and they wrote a paper on it. So all of your information is stored and saved, including the information that you think A is worthless, or B, the information that you think that you haven't agreed to share. So the second is to fight the stereotype. What does that mean? As I mentioned, algorithms are nudging you in a particular way, and now you know, and now you can take action against it. Knowing that the world that you're seeing online is a very lovely curated padded wall to make you feel happy all the time, you have to introduce your own discomfort. You have to say, oh, I wanna know what other people think on this issue and not just constantly read self-reinforcing articles about how terrible person X is or how everyone who thinks Y is dumb, right? I actually want to read the other side. And in doing so, what you actually do is start to train your own algorithm. Um, and that, that I wanna impart on you is actually possible, right? So an algorithm is simply just responsive to the input it's given. The input it's given is the articles you click on, who you subscribe to, who you reply to, how long you spend on particular pages. So in doing so, in doing that search, 
you're, you're training it. So you do have some sort of power and ability. Uh, so I, I, I will say that there's this movement growing now about deleting social media. I actually disagree with it completely. I think social media is amazing. I think it's a really wonderful way for people to mobilize, to meet people who think like them, who may be in the minority. Social media is why the Arab Spring happened. Social media is why Black, Black, Black Lives Matter became popular. There's no other way we would have all been exposed to it if it weren't for social media. However, you need to be very careful of how you interact with social media. If you curate your online presence, think of who you are online. Your digital personality is a reflection of you as a human being. Who are you when you are on Twitter? You shouldn't just be a passive recipient of what's being thrown at you. You say, I want to read this. I don't want to read that. That's the thing I like. This is who I am. Then you'll actually get a lot of value out of all of this media. So it is within your power to control the world that you are being curated and what you see. Thank you very much. Audrey, um, we are going to start our Q&A session and our small panel here, and I know that she just threw out a lot of things um, for you to take into consideration and think about, but we want to hear from you. It's a great audience in here. We can make this a really good, intimate conversation, and for all of you who are watching online at home right now, we want to hear you as well, so make sure you go to in Future of Info. Dot org. You can get into that chat room and start exchanging some ideas. Also, if you're on Twitter, um, hashtag Future of Info. All right, as we set up our chairs here, I'm going to call up our panelists and introduce them to you so we can start our conversation. Um, first up is Diana Nucera. She's um, also is known as Mother Cyborg. She's an artist, an educator, and community organizer that explores innovative technology with communities that are most impacted by the digital divide. And her specialty is developing visionary tools, and one line of her bio inside the AI pamphlet that was handed out today that I hope all of you have, it says she's here to escort you into the future with love. And I think we all need a little bit more of that. So uh, welcome, Diana. Also joining us is John Kwan, and he leads Ford's global efforts to partner with municipalities to identify urban mobility needs while working to create, pilot, and implement new mobility solutions. And hopefully he can share with us a little bit of what Ford is doing in Miami-Dade County yeah. in terms of uh, working with municipalities on yeah. that. So welcome to John. Thank you. And Dr. Chowdhury, if you'd like to join us back out on stage, we would love to have you for this part of the conversation. And you can join us right at that end seat. Perfect. Um, I think all of us had different reactions to uh, Ramon's speech um, in conversation right now, but I'm going to start with Diana and John. I'm going to let you have um, first crack and what, your, what your, your reaction was. Go ahead, Diana. Sure, yeah, so thank you very much. It was uh, really well spoken and just like nice little trajectory of how to think about AI and social impacts. <coughs> Um, and I think the most, the thing that struck me towards the end that um, feels really important to sort of bring up is that the sort of fear of bias, <coughs> and, um, social bubbles being placed within a particular stereotype that is being driven um, at the top of the conversations around technology right now, this particular conversation around social bias is something that's happening all around the world. Um, is a normal day for a person of color and has been for the past 400 years since the beginning of slavery. And so I think that's what, why this conversation is now at the forefront is that now it affects everybody, not just a particular race or culture. So even though that still is quite problematic, that it's taken to become this sort of normalized thing that affects everyone in order for people to now understand that feeling of being boxed or being thought of as something less than you are. And this is something I could speak from as experience from a woman of color and specifically a large bodied queer woman that oftentimes people treat me really bad until they actually hear me speak or they actually know about my work. And so I think this is an opportunity though and um, listening to this conversation, I think what the opportunity here is is that there is a, a potential to now bring in the feeling of empathy into the conversation of structural racism and racism. And I think that's where we have a whole lot of potential to sort of finally grapple with 
the, this country's in particular issues around racism and how structural racism has then really kind of created what we're talking about as racist algorithms or even individuals that are in positions to create these algorithms. And so that's the big thing that came to my mind. Yeah, and I think when Ramon was talking about facing what some of our own biases are when we go forward in, in these conversations, and sometimes though, these are the toughest conversations to have. And I think we've been grappling that uh, with that as a country and a culture for a very long time. John, why don't you go ahead and give me kind of what your, your overall impression was? No, I thought it was, it was great. I think um, there are biases. I was, I was looking at that slide. She talked about where um, the data isn't necessarily an objective truth. It's a subjective truth. But you know, nonetheless, it is, is reflection, a reflection of those biases. We just have to recognize that those biases are there. Um, in the work that, that we're doing at Ford, uh, in terms of mobility, we, in, in the engagements, as you mentioned, with Miami, um, we're, we're starting at a community and an individual level because our goal at Ford is to really bring humanity back into the mobility equation. Um, so much of, of our mobility solutions have centered around personal ownership, and as more and more people move to cities, and we need to deal with issues like congestion and pollution, um, we need to look at more shared modes and, and kind of relaunch that, if you will. And so how do we provide greater access to all? How do we provide greater equity to all? Um, for us, mobility is, is almost something that enables human progress. And therefore, if you can provide that to more, and you can more people, um, more uh, uh, neighborhoods, you provide greater opportunity and greater equity. So uh, many of the things that, that if, if you think about how our mobility uh, ecosystem has evolved um, and where highways have gone through and neighborhoods that have been decimated by that, right? Um, these all have, you can go back and, and be reflective and said, you know, there's, there's some bias threads in there in terms of what's happened. So we have to be cognizant of that, I think, as we move forward. And, and the whole notion of how AI can, can be used for the good, uh, if, if, if you're aware of these biases, and, and help to design that into a new system, or if ignored, they can continue to be used for the bad as well. It can be, it can go either way. You know, and I think it's, it brings up a very interesting point because the thing that struck me when I was listening to your speech, Ramon, was for every Ford or for every other company that Accenture is working with right now into trying to address possible morality issues and ethical issues and ramifications when it comes to this kind of technology, how many companies are not doing that? And how many companies are taking advantage of that when you talk about deep fakes, when you talk about um, exploiting the kind of technology and the data that they have? Um, so when we think about what we can do as people and you look at what are some of the corporations who are choosing not to take that into consideration? Um, so, by the way, thank you for letting me go off stage. I, I packed like a Californian, is how I'll put it. So I've been traveling, and the weather's been colder than this Californian's used to. <laughs> um, Come back in a couple months. I know, right? <laughs> this is colder than California gets, so at least where I am sometimes. Um, so, absolutely. So what I will say is that there's this important sea change happening, and not just in technology, but in corporations in general, where they're understanding this notion of what you might want to call conscious capitalism. And this starts with you know, Larry Fink's letter to what we're seeing in shareholder activism um, and even employee activism to say that you know, your company has to be about more than just revenue. It is not okay to say, oh, we're legally compliant, so sorry. Uh, people are demanding more, and technology is enabling people to demand more. So as I mentioned earlier, using social media to mobilize, the whole delete Uber movement was popularized on social media. So it's very important to, to see that there is this change happening and smart companies like Ford are making these changes and understanding their community before just plowing ahead with the technology. And that, that is of significant value when thinking about the long-term life of an organization, not just the next year or the next five years. And Diana, it kind of makes us also ask the question of, you know, what does fairness look like in AI when computers share in that kind of decision making? I mean, I think that brings the question of what does fairness look like in general. And these are the, I mean, these are the hard things yeah. when we're talking about data and we're talking about programming. Do you, can you program fairness? Well, this is where, this is why I started this sort of conversation talking about empathy and understanding the different social ramifications of each person's, like, identity 
gender, economic status that happens as you navigate the world. And you really, some, what you were talking about a lot was that like these programmers or people who are a part of these, building these systems like aren't dealing with some of the <coughs> things that like maybe not as privileged people are. And so to me, like how do you program towards fairness is, is that you educate yourself on the issues of the world. You educate yourself on the history of racism and the history of like social economic issues within the United States or particularly here in Detroit, which is a whole lot different than other places. So I think it's particular to where you're at mm -hmm. um, and depending on who then is right or like really controlling the system. So to me, fairness starts with the person who is programming and that they are practicing it in their day-to-day -day life. Because you have to really embody these things to create something else that embodies it. And you wrote, um, you wrote this booklet talking about helping people understand AI, helping them understand how it functions in their daily life, and then beyond where we could be in, in five years from now. Share with me a little bit of, of the thought <laughs> process that, w that went into that, though, in, yeah. in, the, in educating people. So a lot of my work, so I'll say this, I'm not an expert in artificial intelligence at all, but I am an expert in community technology and education in particular. And so this book, uh, People's Guide to Artificial Intelligence, really starts from the fact that you can't even enter into this conversation if you don't know what artificial intelligence is. And then as you would see from your talk, that it is so many things. It's woven into everything that we do, how we look at each other, how we treat, how we communicate online. And so in order for people to enter into that conversation with a critical aspect, they need to learn about it. So this book was designed to really create a kind of workbook scenario that takes people through what is AI? What is the history of it? It's not something that's new. It actually dates back to fifth century before common era, this concept of automation, which I found absolutely fascinating. So that brings up more questions as to like, well, what is not just the current social drive of it, but what is the human drive of automation and why does that even exist? And, and how have we manifested it? And this museum is one instance of how it's been manifested. Um, and it's incredible to look at because it sort of really shows like how humans kind of create this like almost like godlike presence. Mm -hmm. And so uh, just to honor and read from the book, I'd like to quote, um, uh, what's her, uh, Pamela McCormick, McCorduck, who was an AI researcher and wrote this book called uh, Machines Who Think back in 1974. And I think that she really sort of puts it into perspective where she says that, um, that explains the AI birth as an ancient wish to forge the gods. Mm -hmm. And I feel like understanding that trajectory of our human desire on top of the current political, economic, social, like, impact that's happening that technology has right now really gives us a perspective as to what's possible and that this comes from uh, almost like a humanistic desire and it doesn't is isn't actually driven by company but companies have the most resources to drive it so what if you were able to design AI for your home what would that look like if so if you could design an AI algorithm to clean your room what would that look like? And so thinking about it. How much it, time do you have? I can, <laughs> I've got three kids. We could work on that right now, right. Diana. But thinking about that on the day-to-day -day personal level and not just as a corporate sort mm -hmm. of consumer level. So really moving us from, the purpose of this is to move us from consumers to producers of technology. But John, you have that ability to be able to look at it from the corporate level. And what does Ford have to do to be able to look at themselves as moving into the future and working with, and working with AI? So we, you know, the, the other, I was, as you were uh, talking, and rather eloquent, that was, that was really well done. Um, I was thinking about the other terms people have used for AI, machine learning, mm -hmm. right? And, and I think when you do that, if you strictly look at it in terms of machines, you forget all of the human contributions that apply to that learning. And left unchecked, you, you almost lose sight of, in many cases, these were done to help ease the burden of laborers, right? If you, if you think of many of the improvements, things that, we're, that are shown here in this museum. But um, one of the things our CEO likes to talk about is this notion of a design gap, that we can continually improve something for the better, yet 
that for which it was originally intended, you lose sight of. And so if we think about the automobile, and if it, one of its primary purposes was not only the democratization of, of transportation, but also to get you basically from point A to point B. We've made the vehicle safer, we've made it cleaner, we've made it uh, more comfortable. But if I'm stuck in traffic for an hour and a half for a 10 mile drive, has it necessarily improved my ability to get from A to B? And so you see these design gaps emerging. And so we as a company are beginning to look again this notion of designing the mobility for humanity is looking at it from a very human-centered perspective. What is it that you're really trying to achieve? What, what are you trying to do with what you need to enable? What mobility solutions you need to enable your lives? And how can we help contribute to that? Ford has always been in the business of, of making carriages that get you from A to B, uh, people and goods. And we look at the future in, in a AI perspective and, and the ultimate manifestation, I think, of AI within an automobile is gonna be an autonomous vehicle, right? But um, how are the things that we've accumulated over 100 years in the mobility space applicable to that future? And how do we design it with the human in mind? How, how, what is an AV gonna feel like for someone if they get into a vehicle? We, we do this a little bit on trains today, but if you were to get in a cab today and there was there was no driver, um, it, would, it would seem strange because there's no referee or captain of that vessel, right? And the only thing that's going to be um, that presence in an autonomous vehicle, if let's say two or four or six people are in it, is gonna be a camera. You know, are people gonna be comfortable with that? Mm -hmm. right? I always think the ultimate expression of trust in an autonomous world will be when I put a child on, a, on an autonomous school bus and I am Rest and secure that that is going to get there. Which they're there. prototyping in Florida right I, now. I've actually. seen that. Yep. Yeah, in a closed campus yes, setting. Yes, yes, right? but yeah. still, it's it's quite compelling. And I, I love that you bring up autonomous vehicles. I think it highlights all of the things we hope and fear about artificial <laughs> intelligence. Right. So, you know, the Uber self-driving car kills one person. So much media. But you think about it. What is it we're so scared of? People die on the road every day due to very human errors. Human. We're, we're so scared to give up agency to this imaginary algorithm or this camera, as you mentioned, you know, the uncanny valley, the ickiness factor, right? whatever you want to call it, what is the human hurdle, emotional hurdle, to overcome, to understand the benefits of this technology, but also, as you mentioned, for designers and creators, how do you make it so that people, people's lives are improved by it? You're not just outsourcing this problem and you're sort of solving for the immediate but not thinking of it holistically. Mm -hmm. I think it's really beautiful. To me, is it coming down to control and trust? Because you have to start designing autonomous vehicles to function in very different places too because not every place is Miami and not every place is in, in a different city in, in Florida. Right. That it's gotta be able to adapt to the very different surroundings and be that personalized experience. So I, I think a lot of it uh, will end up being it, in, it, you know, it's something that, that we're exploring here is the benefits of a network effect, right? We, we really, when people ask me, well, when do you see autonomous vehicles arriving in mass or at scale? And I think there's a precursor to that. It's when the environments in which they're operating in are more connected. So you, you cited, you know, the, the accident that happened in Arizona. Um, and, and part of why it happened is that the vehicle itself was completely reliant on its onboard technologies to recognize that person there. But what if the, the person's cell phone had been connected you know, and identified that person as an object in the vehicle well before it arrived at that point where, mm -hmm. where the person was crossing the street with a bike, knew it was there and could have slowed down, it wasn't reliant. So it's not just reliant on the technologies that are enabling an AV, but it's connected to all the other objects you know, within its, its ecosystem. Because today, if I, if I put an AV in the streets of New York, it's gonna have a very stunted journey to its destination because cab drivers, commercial truck drivers are much more adept at seizing the real estate mm -hmm. in front of them than an AV, which will revert to safety. Mm -hmm. So we have to envision a system where there's a level of orchestration through this connectivity that allows things to work in concert with one another. Yeah. And we think that will bring about a lot, a, a, a lot a, a much more efficient system in terms of flow, yeah. a much more system in ter efficient system in terms of CO2, and that's what we're striving for. I want to remind everyone, we want to get you involved in this conversation, so if you have a question 
for any one of our panelists here. Go ahead and raise your hand, and we're gonna start taking questions from the audience. Diana, you wanted to jump in with something. Well, because you had asked, is it this about trust or control? And my, one of my questions that came to mind, which is so silly, was thinking like, well, if it was a flying autonomous car, maybe we would be more trustful. Like yeah. we, because mm -hmm. this is what science fiction has told us is next. Like we've never had science fiction tell us that autonomous cars are the future of cars. It's always been the flying car right. is next. And so one of the, that was really curious to me thinking about um, the, the role and impact of science fiction in our, and how that really controls our fears. Um, but then also thinking about how fear comes into play when it comes to automation and then work. Um, and so thinking about when you see some, no longer an Uber driver or a Lyft driver or whoever is driving and someone else uh, or a robot's driving me around, that person's lost their job. Mm -hmm. And where are they going? And so may I read an excerpt from my book? Sure. Thank you. Just to bring James Boggs into the room who thought about this. He was an auto worker at Ford in 1970, 1963 he wrote this. and something to sort of think about. Automation replaces men. This, of course, is nothing new. What is new, that now, unlike most earlier periods, that displaced men have nowhere to go. The farmers displaced by mechanization of the farms in the 20s could go to cities and the men to assembly lines. As far as the worker animals, like the mule, they could just stop growing them. But automation displaces people. And you don't just stop growing people, even when they have been made expendable by the system. And I think that brings in a, a, the bigger conversation of what are we training our workforce for the future of, mm -hmm. of, uh, in AI? And what do we need to consider with workforce? And does that automatically mean we are going to be losing people from the workforce when we start implementing a lot of these technologies? Let me go to the audience, though, first and, um, and start to get a couple of questions. Where's our first question out there? Hi there, what's your name? Hi, my name is Kim. OK, and, go uh, ahead. And I, and I work in media a lot. So, um, Two quick things. First of all, it seems uh, on the bias tip, it seems utterly impossible to even grapple with that without coming to grips with history. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's where, that's where everything's come from. We live in history. Yep. So that's one. Uh, and two, sort of just, uh, I'll just put my political cards on the table. Um, you know, Karl Marx dealt a lot with, he made a lot of mistakes, but one of the things he talked about was the role of technology in the economy which is totally ignored now. And what he, he the, the traditional view from Marx was that the technology would come, we would get income from somewhere else, and that these things would do all the things that we normally, and that's what's happening. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Quiet as it's kept, except we're not, we don't have the income part to replace it. Um, there, are, there are algorithms now that are looking to grade papers, that are looking to do jobs that I do, like do, dealing in the media. And so uh, my brother, who is extremely conservative, not a Marxist by any stretch, he says something really interesting to me. He says that robots don't buy cars. He works for Ford Motor Company, by the way. Uh, <laughs> and you know, so I would like for folks to come to grips with the fact that robots don't buy cars, mm -hmm. and they also, uh, you know, don't. You, you know, it, it's not just the cars that are coming undone by robots, but yep. all sorts of intellectual jobs as well. I, I have so many thoughts on what you were just raising in your question, and thank you for raising that. So the term algorithmic determinism is actually sponsor, uh, is inspired by this term called technological determinism, which is from you know, the era of the steam engine, which understands the role of technology in society. So absolutely, I updated it with this concept of algorithmic determinism, but there, there is this, this, that's what a lot of the responsible AI movement is about. It's understanding the, and appreciating, more importantly, not just understanding, appreciating the role of technology in society and how we live in this very pivotal moment that we call the fourth industrial revolution for a reason. So the other thing is, part of what you're talking about, this whole robots don't buy cars, I think you're starting to touch on something really important. The way we value society, you know, I'm a quantitative social scientist, everything for me is a utility function, right? People optimize their utility function. Seriously, we do. So we have these measurements of things. So for a country, a measurement of success would be like a GDP. A GDP is actually a very broken metric. If you break it down, it's a measurement. It's actually not an absolute value of how valuable your country is. It's a, a formula people made up a very long time ago when we relied on things like factories and widgets and things like that. 
And moving forward, let's say I, as a thinker and a consultant, like contribute nothing to GDP because I don't make a widget or, or do things. I consume things, but I don't, I, I don't make, and even now, most, a lot of the things I consume are maybe media or virtual or live in the cloud. How the heck do we measure and capture that value because we don't? So there's a whole movement called Beyond GDP, which thinks about how we reimagine GDP because also, by the way, for all the women in the room, when GDP was calculated, it was specifically calculated to not value childcare and elder labor and home care because those were considered to be women's jobs and women's jobs were valueless. There, there is actually a book called What If Women Counted that talks about that. So there is sort of this larger push to reimagine, like almost fundamentally, this is the beautiful thing about the era we live in, we can do these things now. We can fundamentally measure the value of taking care of a child and include that, right? This is why we live in a country in which it's so hard for women to strike that middle balance. Well, we shouldn't have to because the, va the work that you do at home isn't often valued and it should be. So we have this amazing opportunity to reimagine it. And also you're 100% right about what are we doing with this future of work? Are we just replacing jobs with other jobs? We think about it when we created email and we no longer sent letters or memos in, into the office. Theoretically, that should have opened up so much time for us and yet I think everyone in this room often <laughs> feels like a slave to their email. So we just opened up that time and filled it up with more things to do. Right, and then it just got longer and longer, and then we became nature, constantly. Nature of horrors of vacuum, doesn't it? Exactly. So, 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 like, I completely agree that we need to really fundamentally reimagine a the value of our activities and actions, um, and b what it is we will spend this free time doing, and then adequately, as you to tie into your uh, factory worker example, to to adequately compensate the people whose labor will be taken away in whatever form that may be, but. That's, a, that's such a, it's almost such a foreign thing to think about, but mm -hmm. it's, it's a way in which we can use this technology to fundamentally shift humanity, which is what it should be doing. Mm -hmm. All right, let's go to another question in the audience. Who else has a question? Hi, I'm Olga Stella with Design Core Detroit. Oh, and I've been yeah. thinking a little bit about um, just Dr. Chaudhry's comment around how we should protect our data um, and not, you know, think of it as a commodity and not just give it up. But then also um, the disparities in the data that we're each individually throwing off. So it would be, it'd be interesting to hear back from, from all of you on the panel, both, um, so from maybe Dr. Chaudhry, how, how do we individually protect that data beyond social media? Um, and, and I think from Diana and, and John, just you know, when we think about the, the person crossing the street who's trying, hopefully being avoid, not being hit by the, the AV, what if they don't have a cell phone right. in their pocket? Um, how do we how do we account for for the differences in the in our data footprints and how that influences the systems that ultimately get developed in our cities? Yeah, people are are, are impacted in different ways. Yeah. Do you want to start? Absolutely. So um, you raise an excellent point of how do you protect your own data? Because when you sign away your data consent, it's often in perpetuity. So you can say, all right, I'm gonna delete my social media account, but by the way, you have no rights to the information that you've given for the however many years you've had that account. Um, so GDPR, General Data Protection Regulation, goes a long way. It gives you, for example, the right to not be found and the right to take back your information. The state of California has passed a privacy law, very similar, and there's been more push, and this is, the, this is how the, the regulatory space can be involved. Because as an individual, there's only so much fighting back you can do to recapture your data. I'll give you an example. Um, just yesterday or the day before, Ancestry.com is working with Spotify to give you DNA-inspired playlists. Mm. And I mean, maybe it's funny, and maybe it's not <laughs> yeah. funny. But you're like, well, Christmas when I did too. my, you know, I, it's not really what it's used for, but why on earth, like, I, I did not agree to have my data used that way. Mm -hmm. um, Similarly, 23andMe was sharing genetic information, um, you know, with uh, Gla I want to say GlaxoSmithKline to start, you know, doing genetic testing for drugs. And again, we did not agree to that. And that, by the way, we have no rights over that information. So genetic information, by the way, is number one thing you should protect. Um, you know, and, and you have no rights to it once you've used one of these services. Um, so it's it, it's critical a that people get educated, but b that 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 can really only come from a regulatory level. 
John, did you want to comment on Olga's question? I was, I was thinking, like, I'm the son of Dutch and Colombian immigrants, and I'm wondering what Spotify would choose as a playlist. <laughs> that would be so, amazing. Would be but also how it feeds playlist, into algorithmic of, determinism, yeah. right? Like, what is it assuming about you because of your race, race and ethnicity, yeah. right? Like, maybe I just like punk rock. You know, you don't look right. like somebody who does, but mm, maybe I do. Yeah, so I think with, with regards to the data, I, obviously you have to guard, uh, guard that preciously, and you have to opt in. I, I think. We as consumers have made uh, choices. We get search for free because we've given up mm -hmm. the the right to to essentially pull that back and say I don't I don't necessarily want someone to capture all of my search. Or we give up um, when we use mapping tools, right? We are giving up origin and destination points, and there's there's value to that data. So I I think you have to be cognizant of what that trade-off is and are you, are you willing to do that? Is the utility mm -hmm. of being able to get from A to B or to find out very quickly what you want worth the constant barrage of, of ads that are based on past searches? It's, it's amazing to me the, 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 the long memory that Google has, right? Because stuff that I either put in a shopping cart a year ago still turns up you know, on the right-hand side of that margin on the screen. Um, and, then, and then with regards to um, the identify, the, you know, the ability for objects to identify themselves in a system if they don't, if, if that object doesn't have technology. I think this is where we really have to think about the network effect because if if enough connectivity exists within a given system, and let's think about an intersection as a as an example of that, um, and there's cameras there to kind of monitor what's going on in that intersection, and other things are connected. We shouldn't necessarily have to rely on everyone to be connected or everything to be identified because other objects in that system should be able to let you know, other objects know that there's something there, but we just don't know what it is, all right? So let's be cognizant of that. But that requires this level of connectivity that, that we haven't yet reached. It's, it's increasing exponentially, but you know, we, we talk about it in terms of modes, uh, roads and, and loads, for lack of a better term uh, to describe goods are all nodes on the Internet of Things, we'll have a better sense of orchestration and a better sense of what's happening in that intersection. So, uh, so actually, so one that I forgot to address the second part of your question, which I thought actually think is great. So two things that highlights, number one, is what's the socioeconomic barrier to entry? Because you have to be able to afford a cell phone to even be captured by this network, and the literal erasure then of your existence if you don't. But then on the flip side, the slippery slope of connectivity is good, but then, you, wh where is it where you reach surveillance state status, yeah. right? And, and even just having rules and regulations about it, not always sufficient. So for example, in the Bay Area, our, our rapid transit, the BART, had installed cameras at certain stations to use image recognition to identify license plates and people in case cars got stolen, because a lot of cars were getting stolen. Interestingly, the, the, the BART authority takes a very strong stance against a surveillance state. Um, and they actually decided, you know what, we're not going to use this technology. They had enabled it. It was all up. They're like, we're not going to use it for that purpose. But they found out that the station used it anyway. So, you know, when you have the system in place, it's very tempting to use it. Because, you know, to your point, as consumers, we have something called a privacy paradox, right? And every uh, tech product person knows this, where people actually want really customized products. Like, I love when Spotify knows exactly what I want to listen to. But we feel like we don't want to give up the information. So we're, face, we're giving them this conundrum where don't take my information, but give me exactly what I want all the time. And it's an irrational paradox, but there it is. So it's not that we are you know, so righteous in our demands. We are actually quite conflicting in our demands. And often, by the way, we'll go to the past of least resistance, lowest friction, most personalization. When, when we feel, we, we sort of justify it to ourselves often. Yeah, and I know we do have to have the conversation about diverse communities who may be mm -hmm. shut out of technology and their access that they're not diversely mm -hmm. affected by AI. But Diana, go ahead. very false. You are being, your data is being collected whether you have a smartphone or not. So oh, I just yeah, want no. to put, yes, I, absolutely. Because if I'm, you no, no, are no, 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 going to sign up for you. government assistance, that your, all of your data, that's data collection. When you go to the store and they ask you for your phone number to get your perks, that is data collection. When, you, when you're asked for your email address, so I, I just wanted to put that out there that the, the term data bodies exists whether or not you are online or offline. And the problem is with those people who are offline have no idea 
that their data is even being collected and being then used against them to criminalize them. So this is the biggest issue that I think is happening is within the digital divide is that there's this, well, I'm not online, it doesn't affect me. Absolutely it affects you. Um, and, and particularly, I mean, think about it and how it's just data collection in itself is biased is that, you know, all of the paperwork you have to fill out to even get any type of assistance, I don't know if anyone's even filled out a, for a passport, so think about all the data you have to put in for that. Your, your social security card, your, there's so many things, even your uh, license is lots of data collection. So this brings us to this uh, issue of consent. And this issue has only come up recently because of all of the data breaches that have happened within the current administration. Now there were privacy acts that were put out there and also the net neutrality, which might be something you're more familiar with, has recently been repealed, but the very first thing that our current administration did was repeal the Privacy Act so that your data is no longer private no matter what whether you have it on your phones, you have, there are ways that you can protect yourself through virtual private networks or encryption and stuff like that, which a lot of people are actually making money off of because of the repeal of that policy. So I just kind of wanted to put that out there that if you, uh, it's, it's both and, like everyone is affected by data. And then the, uh, the caveat of it is though, without it, we would not have AI. So, so I wanted to clarify, I completely agree with you. My intent of my sim was not to say that just because you don't have a cell phone, you cannot be found. Social media <coughs> makes shadow profiles of you. Even if you've never been on it, um, they know by, certain, by buying certain information and the information of the people <coughs> around you, up to about 80% accuracy, who you are is rather scary. So by the way, just, I completely agree yeah, with yeah. you that there's no way to be fully off the grid. And the best you can do is have certain rights and protections, which currently in the US we are not afforded at all. All right, let's go ahead and take another question. Who has another question? Do you have anyone? Oh. Hi there. Hi, I have a question. My name is Maddie. Um, I'm from Lawrence Tech. Um, my question is, you guys were saying that these people that are creating the algorithms, that they're biased, or that, they, that there is a possibility that they're biased. Is it even possible to have someone that's creating an algorithm not be biased? Because there's also people that are above them that are telling them, you have to make it this way. <laughs> there's more than one person that's making the algorithm, and I think that's one thing that goes unnoticed is, when someone's making an algorithm, just because there's the techie person that's creating it, doesn't mean he's the only one making the decisions. It's the whole entire company that he is working for. So when he goes, oh yeah, I did it because I'm the engineer or whatever, like, yeah, he's also, what about his job? He's losing his job because if he doesn't do it how the company says he needs to do it, then there goes his job. So I think it goes more along the lines of, is, there, is it even possible to create, some, to create an unbiased algorithm? So there's two parts to your question. The, the term bias is very, so thank you for the question. So the term bias is very loaded as I sort of said in the first part of my talk. Um, and all human beings have bias. So then to that point, you're right. No single person should hold the power of determining the outcome. And you asked earlier about fairness. Um, and interestingly, fairness is a massive topic of conversation in the responsible AI community. Earlier this year, I came out with something called the fairness tool. Um, Google came out with theirs two weeks ago, and IBM came out with theirs last week. Google's is called the What If Tool. You can go online and play with it. IBM's is called Fairness 360. Um, and for all of those, it's a way of understanding and highlighting algorithmic bias. So you are 100% correct as a data scientist. It is a massive responsibility then that I have to shoulder. If I have to think about every potential bad way this algorithm might be used, or in the context in which it might be used, in communities that I may not even really understand, or have the time, skill, or ability to learn about. And this is why the whole, the whole, the company's culture as a whole is very, very valuable. So at Accenture, what I'm finding is that, you know, people come and they say, I'm really interested in this fairness tool, really want to start ex exploring my algorithms. And then this tech conversation becomes a conversation about good data governance, good AI governance, and company culture. So what's really interesting is like all the projects that I do that start off with the fairness tool end up becoming a project about strategy, corporate strategy, corporate culture, who you hire, what, you know, and you're absolutely right. If you're a data scientist and you're working on a project, I've been there, if you find something wrong with your data, you have to know the same way 
you, all regular citizens need to know, that I can raise my hand and say, hey, I think there's something wrong here. So number one, it's my job to enable people with the tools to identify if something's wrong, that's the fairness tool. But number two, that person has to feel empowered by company culture, by rules of accountability, by systems of governance, to be able to go to the right person and say, I think there's something wrong here, let's fix this thing, and not have the person shoot them down. You're 100% correct that so much of this is about the intangible culture and not just about having tech tools to solve tech problems. You have another question? Got a couple of hands. Up a couple of hands up there. Diana, did you want to comment on something? Or? Uh, exactly, it's around diversifying the perspective mm -hmm. of who's creating. I like to use the metaphor of an ecosystem and um, monocrops. So for instance, you can't grow tomatoes in the same garden bed uh, two years in a row or else they won't grow because there's not enough nutrients for the, because they've sucked it all up the first year. So you actually have to switch and maybe put some beans that will refill the, uh, the dirt. And yes, I am a gardener. Um, but what I'm getting at is that like it requires uh, a diverse perspective and if you don't have a diverse perspective then you end up sort of just focusing on one particular nutrient um, but when you have a whole ecosystem for instance think about a uh, rainforest and how amazing um, species of animals can emerge out of this robust ecosystem um, and that's where wonder and awe come in place and innovation and things that like make us feel like life is absolutely incredible happens when you do have diversity at the center of a space. That's why cities thrive. Right? That's why, that's why cities well, thrive. Yeah. So let me ask you, John, real quick then. So you are in the position and the ability to look <coughs> for that diverse perspective, to hire that diverse perspective when you are then starting to design and do all the work that Ford is doing right now. <coughs> what should people be studying or looking to get into if they want to get into the field or be, be caught up in the same speed of where AI is taking us right now? Well, I, I mean, there's, there's, so, there's, there's, the, there's obviously the technical side to this. Now, I'm not going to encourage everyone to become coders or all young people become coders. There's a social <laughs> science aspect to this. I think um, with, the re with, the, with the acknowledgement that cities are going to continue to grow and that we have to find better ways to move people within cities, urban planning is all of a sudden a sexy you know, profession uh, to be in. So th these are all uh, pr uh, either paths of study or professions that will contribute, I think, ultimately to this. I don't think there's one, you know, one particular path. I think it's gonna take um, a variety of talents uh, to really come together. If you think about uh, with our investment uh, now being very public with the, the Michigan Central train station, um, we've committed to, to convening 5,000 employees down there between the station and the other properties that, that we're, um, we, we're uh, putting together to create this mobility campus. Only half of those are going to be Ford employees. The other half, we want to be entrepreneurs. We want them to be suppliers. We want them to be startups. We want them to be creatives, right? It's, it's a notion that the, the head of our Ford Land Division, Dave Dubinsky, talks about creating collisions, creative collisions and having people you know, together in coffee shops, together in, at lunch, together in, in social settings that'll be there to actually create something that's, that's, that's gonna be more than just one company you know, with its people. So um, we'll see how it comes. It looks like it's worked in other places and mm -hmm. uh, we're, we're gonna be excited to bring it here to Detroit. All right, let's get another question in here in the last five minutes Front. that we have. Also, you could start by reading this book. Go ahead. <laughs> Yep, hi, go ahead. Um, my question is, um, I'm Blythe Murphy from U of M Dearborn, and we're always thinking about how to get more women into STEM careers. I will say I'm also the mother of boy-girl twins, so I see it already at eight years old. My daughter, she's not on Facebook, she's not on Instagram, but on YouTube, uh, everything that's coming to her is shopping, you know, makeup videos, you know, uh, a makeover today. And my son, it's all, take a coding class, learn how to code. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden I see my daughter switch and say, I don't want to be a doctor anymore. I want to be a fashion designer. Not that that's not a great career, but in thinking about getting women to the STEM fields, how can we kind of work with younger women to counteract that bias? We've, we see instructional bias in the classroom. They're leaving being interested in STEM in middle school. And with social media pushing them even further away from that, how can we teach them to be educated cons consumers? I guess would be my question. Ramana, I'm yeah, gonna let you take that one. Yes. Um, that's, such a, that's a really great question. It's so multifaceted. 
Um, so I totally agree with you that girls are often, girls and boys are targeted very different ways and you know, not just on YouTube, but when you walk into a store and the kinds of toys and clothes and messages that they're given. And as a parent, I'm sure it feels like, well, how do I even fight this? Um, there are some amazing summer programs that are opening up for girls. So AI for All, started by uh, Dr. Fei-Fei Li of Google, um, is a really fabulous, fabulous summer program. Um, but what I, what I want to highlight here is this sort of singular narrative. And I was talking to somebody who works in augmented reality. So interesting, the AR VR space has a lot of women in it. Um, and there's this interesting cultural narrative here about girls who played Sims and had Neopets which were these like digital toys from, you know, when people my age, a little bit younger, were like in high school. And that was their in, because there was nothing made for girls until then. And before then, it was very video games and shoot 'em up and things like that. So the, this narrative we have of a, of a programmers being a particular way, but B, um, what the pathway is, is, very, is flawed and it's very singular. And there are actually things that interest a lot of girls um, that would lead to a career in tech, but the images we put out there of what it means to have a career in tech doesn't seem like it's aligned with, let's say, being a fashion designer. But to be honest, she would love augmented reality. She'd want to learn Unity program because once she saw that, hey, you know what, I can create dresses and then people in, can look at a mirror and then see that dress on themselves, like she would absolutely be all about it. So encouraging what she's drawn towards and then seeing the, the tech impact of it, I think is very beautiful. And that's kind of a narrative that's missing because we're so tied into this singular narrative of what it means to, to be a program. And especially as, as it permeates more into society, it's in everything we do. So you're talking about you know, sort of STEM education. I feel like the acronym keeps growing. It was STEM, then it was STEAM, the A being art, and now it's STEAMED with the D being design. Um, and there's a lot of creative thinking and design. Every, pod, every AI project at Accenture starts with a design-led thinking session mm -hmm. without fail. I do them for responsible AI implementations. You cannot do a good project without design-led thinking. Um, so it's, it's critical that we draw girls in in a way that's, that's suited to them. But then, of course, we have to talk about the gender bias that exists in school, the hiring bias that exists in companies. And there's so many parts to tackle, but it is not an insurmountable hill to climb. All right, I, I have to wrap this up, but I want, to leave, I want each of you to, to leave us with a final thought going forward today, how we should be thinking about AI in our daily lives, how things are going to be changing. I'm going to, I hate to time you, but I'm going to give you each about, <laughs> think about like about 45 seconds of, of a final thought of what we can kind of take, and I'm going to start with you, Diana. Um, well, just playing off of that last comment, one of the things I was thinking about was imagine what it's like for gender non-conforming or trans youth to be in this yeah. world of um, algorithm bias. Um, and I think the thought I want to leave you with is the thought that I started with, was that in order to, the opportunity we have now in thinking about um, our own sort of um, disappointment with the future of technology is embodying the, um, the experiences of people of color for centuries and that you now have empathy to work with. So what will you do with it? Okay, John? Uh, I would say this, this notion of truly understanding what, what are you solving for? What human need are you solving for? Um, the, the design phase up front, don't, don't be prescriptive. Don't just assume you know what you're either coding for or building for. Truly understand uh, the need you're addressing or the problem that you're solving and ensure that it's designed it. Ramon, you get the yeah, final word. Um, there's so much. This was such an inspirational conversation. I really want to reiterate how um, inspirational this location is as well. Um, and what this has reminded me as the technologist who goes around the world and, and talks about this kind of stuff is that this concept of innovation is not new. Um, and world-changing things have happened due to technology. And now we're being given this gift of a new, a new technology. How do we reimagine things like the future of work, uh, GDP, the future of education, how we can overcome all of these hurdles and barriers to entry that have typically existed for people who did not fit a particular mold or paradigm. All of these things can be answered by using this technology, but it will not automatically happen. That is an automatic outcome. So how do we mobilize positively to use this as a force for good? Dr. Ruman Chowdhury, John Quant, and Diana Nussera, thank you so much. Thanks. What a great audience. What a great conversation. Thank you. Thank you.
It is my pleasure now to uh, wrap up the afternoon and bring up Katie Locker. She is the Detroit Program Director of the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation. Katie. Uh, well, my first job is to thank everybody up here, and I first have to thank Dr. Chowdhury, who not only traveled to be with us, presented her thoughts, and then conquered the cough. Um, <laughs> um, so thank you so much for coming out with us. Um, and then I want to thank John and Diana for coming, and Christy for sticking with us throughout the series to offer her insights and help us have these conversations that are so complicated. And uh, when Miriam Nolan, who leads the Community Foundation, and I first talked about how this series might play out, uh, it, this was really it. It was, how do we have a conversation about really complicated technologies that are interacting with our everyday lives? And then how do we talk about, how does that involve people and our communities to then take action to make sure they're a part of what happens? And uh, the three conversations we've had, and I have to say, all led by remarkable women who are thinking about science, technology, community, and the impacts, um, have really been a part of that. And we're now, uh, this is our last announced uh, event of 2018, but we're really examining what's next. Um, and so um, please stick with us. There are resources uh, available online on the Community Foundation's website. There's also gonna be information shared on the website about how to get a copy of the book that Diana co-authored and that has been, been referenced. I also wanna point you to the Knight Foundation's website for folks who are interested in a national conversation about the role of technology and the media in particular, but we just announced in the last week, um, and John and I were talking about it before, Knight is also investing in questions of how is technology impacting the future of cities and smart cities, and we have some mobility investments. So the Knight Foundation is involved in the, in the national conversation as well. So I thank you all for coming. I thank the Community Foundation sincerely for leading this work, and I really look forward to what's next. I'm confident we'll be back in 2019 with more conversation. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much.